First we do the oath in English, then we do the oath in French. All together, I affirm, I affirm. that I will be. Stanley G. Grizel is Canada's first black citizenship court judge. In the long battle to win rights for all citizens, Judge Grizel is one activist among many. Now he officially bestows these rights on new Canadians. I'm very pleased to be the first person to address you as fellow Canadian citizens. Now in our court this afternoon, we have 80 faces from 25 places representing the races. Now we urge you to maintain your cultures and your traditions, and at the same time, share in, enjoy, and above all, respect the cultures of others around you. Few people in this courtroom know that Judge Grizel's journey began six decades ago when he started working as a porter on the Canadian Pacific Railway. In the 1800s and early 1900s, thousands of blacks arrived in Canada from the United States and the West Indies. They dreamed of a life of opportunity and equality in a country renowned as the terminus on the Underground Railroad. The potent symbol of their freedom was Uncle Tom's Cabin, located in Dresden, Ontario. It was the home of Josiah Henson, who had escaped to Canada from slavery. When they arrived, the reality for most of the newcomers was a life of segregation, servitude, and discrimination. For the next 100 years, blacks would have to fight to gain their rights as Canadians. The most damaging form of discrimination was economic. Black women, at least, were permitted to work as domestics. But for black men, the prospects were bleak. Stanley Grizel remembers when his father first got into the taxi business in Toronto. He was a Toronto's only, non-white taxi driver when I was a youngster. And I recall him coming home and him telling us that um, the taxi drivers, the white fellows, were giving him a hard time, calling him nigger and telling him they didn't want any niggers on the taxi stand. And uh, he fell asleep in his car one, one night and uh, somebody opened the door and slashed his face with a razor. And I can never forget when the police brought him home, he was moaning and groaning, never forgot that. Canada in the 1920s was still essentially white and British. And for the Canadian government, race was grounds for admission or exclusion from the country. Blacks and other minorities were denied housing and land grants. Across the country, they were turned away from apartments, restaurants, hotels, beaches, parks, and even hospitals. Discrimination was permissible and acceptable. In the United States, Jim Crow was legislated. The law said black people must use separate facilities, black people must have separate schools, black people must sit in different parts of the cinemas or ride in different cars in the train. In Canada, the law didn't say you must. What the law said in Canada was you may. And most employers chose to exercise their option to discriminate. All aboard. All aboard. The only place where black men were welcome in the workforce was the railroad. For many, including Stanley Grizel, it was the rails or nothing. We were called George invariably by the public. That's how they were addressed us because, of course, George Pullman was the inventor of the first sleeping car in the United States of America. And so porters were in the early days were referred to as George's boys. And by the time I started on the road, it was, well, good morning, George, how are you? You were just uh, considered to be like the equipment, you, you were not treated 
you know, as, as a human being. The porter on the railroad was the bottom of the barrel. Even the news agent received more respect. You were their servant. You made the bed. You cleaned the toilets. You cleaned the spittoon. That's a word you don't hear now, cuspidor or spittoon. And in those days, most men spit. I cleaned them. I shined the shoes. I cleaned messy beds. But uh, this is all I could get. 1932, the Summer Olympics in the city of Los Angeles. On the Canadian 4x400 relay team is the sprinter Ray Lewis, one of Canada's first black Olympians. Ray Lewis was born in Hamilton, Ontario, to a third generation Canadian family. I was born in 10, 1910, but in the 20s, I started to realize what, what, that I was black. I knew it. My father was fairly dark complected, my mother fairly light complected. But that didn't mean duly squat. In those days, you were just a nigger. That's all there was to it. And I, I knew it from the time I was a youngster. When I was real young, I got Valentine's at school. After I got about 10 years old, the little girls didn't send the black kids' uh, valentines anymore. Years later, in his teens, Ray Lewis saw a fiery cross blazing on Hamilton Mountain. It was a reminder from the Canadian Ku Klux Klan of their presence in Ontario and the rest of Canada. And about all that distinguished the Canadian Klansmen from their American brothers was the maple leaf on their robes. On the track field, no one cared about Ray Lewis's color. Oh, it's wonderful. We were athletes, and track and field athletes were a different breed. We were teammates, equal, equal. There was no animosity, no feeling of color or anything. We we're just runners. We trained together, we ate together, we slept together. It was just perfect. In the great Olympic stadium, jammed to the gunnel. We're getting a bird's eye view. The Canadian 4x400 relay team broke through and won the bronze medal that year. For Ray Lewis, it was the highlight of a sprinting career that had already earned him a trophy case full of awards. But victory on the track field changed nothing in the real world. Back home, Lewis soon faced the reality that while the economic prospects had brightened for other Olympians, not for him. When he approached track and field officials in Hamilton about a job as a coach, he found one door after another closed. Discouraged, Ray Lewis, Olympic medalist, was forced to return to the railroad as a porter. The color bar was firmly in place even in a city as cosmopolitan as the Montreal of the 1930s. The city had a vibrant nightlife, hosting black musicians and entertainers from all over the world. But even here, the line was drawn. Blacks were welcomed as performers, but not as patrons. And if there was any doubt about that, this example, in 1936, made it crystal clear. Uh, a man named Fred Christie, a black man in Montreal, went into the Montreal Forum. He had a season's ticket to the hockey games of the Montreal Forum. And he went in one night with uh, two friends, one black, one white, and uh, there was a new tavern that had just opened uh, called the York Tavern. And so, at Christie's suggestion, apparently, the three friends went in to have a beer. You could buy three beers and get changed for 50 cents, and this was in 1936. Christy put down 50 cents, and the waiter said, apparently very politely, I'm sorry, sir, but we can't serve colored people here. Fred Christie expected to be able to buy a beer in this place, and so he was, he was shocked and disappointed when he didn't, and then he decided to take it to court. It eventually got appealed uh, up to the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, where Fred Christie lost 
This set the legal precedent because the Supreme Court, the final court in the land, had upheld the legality of racial discrimination. It was perfectly legal for a tavern or any other business in Canada uh, to choose its customers on grounds of race. The Supreme Court decision shocked black Canadians. But the community would soon suffer an even greater setback. Nineteen thirty nine. Canadians across the country were being mobilized as Nazism threatened the world's democracies. Canada, as an independent member of the British Commonwealth of Nations, voted to follow England into the war. Entering the call to arms, hundreds of thousands of Canadian men and women went into uniform. Prime Minister Mackenzie King proudly applauded them. They are placing their lives at the service of king and country. But theirs is even a greater mission. It is the preservation for our own and future generations of the freedom begotten of persecutions, martyrdoms, and of centuries of struggle. But that freedom, in King's words, begotten of centuries of struggle, clearly had limits. In 1939, a number of my friends went marching up to the recruiting officer and, and wanted to join because there was no work, of course, and were told, sorry, we don't want you. And it was not until, oh, 1940, 41, uh, that they finally allowed blacks. Blacks were not permitted to join the Navy, for example. Black men had fought for Canada in every conflict in its history. During the First World War, they had served in segregated units. But now, in the fight against Hitler, blacks and other minorities were turned away. As the casualties in Europe mounted, conscription finally forced their acceptance into the Canadian forces. But even then, wearing the King's uniform was no guarantee of respect, as Private Stanley Grizel was soon to discover. He had been married a few days before he was shipped out for active duty. But the honeymoon in Toronto was spoiled. I had reserved a room at the Walker House Hotel, so when we got to the hotel, they had no reservation for us. Found out later. They allowed blacks to drink in the beer parlor, part of the hotel, but you couldn't rent a room. After being rejected by two other hotels, Grizel and his bride were forced to stay with family. I couldn't see the point of volunteering to uh, <laughs> make the world safe for democracy when I wasn't having, getting much of a taste of it, you know, in my own country. Once overseas, Grizel discovered what the army had planned for him. He was ordered to become a batman. A batman shined his officer's boots, cleaned his clothes, and tidied his tent. As Grizel saw it, he would be a domestic in uniform. But he soon found there were worse duties. Because I refused to be a batman, uh, and I told the officer that uh, I didn't it wasn't a regimental duty and I didn't choose to do it. I was put on honey bucket duty for a week, emptying the buckets containing urine and feces because we did not have uh, toilets to flush. And the next week, I noticed the, the assignment sheet, Grizel, honey bucket duty again. I said to my sergeant, I'm going on strike. I'm not going to do anything. Oh man, he got, he was hysterical. You can't do this, you have to. I said, I'm not doing anything because I'm being punished for not wanting to be a Batman. Grizel took his battle up the chain of command. The army gave in and assigned him to the quartermaster stores. By war's end, he and thousands of other black soldiers had served with distinction. They'd fought and died for their country and they came home believing they had earned the right to be respected as equals. They were in for a rude awakening. One of these black Canadian soldiers was leading aircraftman Donald Carty. But when they got back and found out the same old entrenched generational social attitudes that I would employ you, but I don't know how my uh, employees or how my uh, customers are going to feel, 
an evasion and a total disregard as you as being a part of the human family. Disregarding the contribution that you made, uh, a case of, well, that's nice that you went to the war, but you're black. During the Second World War, blacks were in fact demonstrating their love of country and their patriotism. By war's end, this patriotism was canceled. It is somewhat ironic to think that Canada's former enemies could be treated much better than the very soldiers who fought in both world wars to help preserve Canadian democracy and European democracy. Black veterans found that old social attitudes hadn't changed. Blacks had lived in Nova Scotia for more than 200 years. Many had come as black empire loyalists. Just outside of Halifax was a place called Africville. Africville had been neglected for decades. Now it became a dumping ground for municipal garbage. I can still see it. And there's a house there. And I could see the big uh, cement pipes, which I'm told were the sewer pipes that was leading the sewer, emptying it in the harbor. And it ran by this guy's home. And as we drove along, there was this great big mountain of stuff, and it looked like garbage, it looked like a dump. And there are like people or things moving. We got closer, and I noticed this black people scavenging on the dump. I couldn't believe it, man, that in this country, and in this age, that people are living like that, and it is allowed. This was the reality of segregation in Nova Scotia. Even middle-class blacks outside the ghettos couldn't break the race barrier. And in 1946, the extent of bigotry was revealed in the Viola Desmond case. That case became a landmark in Nova Scotia's racial history. Ironically, segregation had helped make Viola Desmond a successful businesswoman. Her hairdressing salon in Halifax was thriving on the fact that blacks were prohibited from white establishments. She also had a growing business, selling beauty products for black women. In those days, women didn't go to university. She went to finish her high school, grade 12, and took a course and uh, took a program in at the academy in business practice. She opened up a school, a school of beauty culture. She even told me that she saw them going across Canada because there were no black beauty parlors at that time. In the meantime, she married. Her husband was a barber, so he had a barber shop there and she had a beauty parlor there. Viola Desmond traveled extensively around Nova Scotia, looking for opportunities to expand her business. On one of these trips, her car broke down in the small town of New Glasgow. And the mechanic told her it was gonna take a few hours to fix the car, so she went to a cinema, the Roseland Cinema, and uh, she decided she'd kill some time by watching a movie. She handed the ticket salesperson one dollar and said, one down, please. Got a ticket. And the ticket taker said, you've got to go uh, upstairs. This is an upstairs ticket. As far as I know, there was no law in any books that said that black people had to sit upstairs. They made their own rules. And this, this unearthed it, the fact that there was an unwritten rule. I don't think she had any idea at all that it was segregated. Um, she was not with anybody from the Glasgow. Did they call it nigger heaven or something really coarse like that? But I think that was the nigger balcony or something or other. Uh, but she said she wasn't going up there. She paid for downstairs. When Viola Desmond refused to move, the manager called a policeman and the two of them literally dragged her out of the theater. Despite injuries to her knee and hip, 
She was jailed overnight. The next day, she was uh, charged and convicted of defrauding the province of Nova Scotia of one cent in, um, in uh, amusement tax, because the tax on the upstairs ticket was two cents, and the tax on the downstairs ticket was three cents. And because she had been given an upstairs ticket and had sat downstairs, uh, according to this logic, she hadn't paid enough tax. Civil rights groups in Nova Scotia immediately organized a campaign for Viola Desmond to challenge the conviction. It went through the appeal process through to the Supreme Court in Nova Scotia, where Mrs. Desmond lost. It was the notion that when we try to exert our rights, we're the ones who get punished instead of the bad person doing the violation. That's what horrified and animated the population. Uh, and so there was a movement sparked uh, as a result of the disappointment of the Desmond case. It was very similar to what had happened uh, elsewhere. Uh, if we don't have these rights, if the law really doesn't support us, then we shall have to change the law. After that, we've had all kinds of people now that come forward and fight for their freedom, liberty, equal rights, all of these things. It did make a difference. For years, the railway porters wanted to make a difference to their appalling working conditions and to their lives. In 1945, they made a breakthrough. After years of clandestine work, the porters had formed a union. It not only gave them better pay, and better working conditions, it made George's boys a force to be reckoned with. The Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters was a godsend to us. It was a godsend. It gave us manhood. The Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters did change the black community uh, right across the country, wherever it existed. And uh, as a matter of fact, the brother of Sleeping Car Porters became the, the official spokespersons for the black community. Whenever an issue came up concerning uh, a black person, we were immediately consulted by the media. What do you think about this? What do you think the solution is to the problem? And so we were, we were recognized and respected. It also gave the Porters an invaluable lesson in politics. Across the country, they used their organizational skills to challenge the color barriers in the communities where they lived. Out of that process of learning to negotiate and to sit from other people across the table, usually white individuals, they developed an ability that helped them and would help the community in the 1950s because we were no longer at the start of the learning curve. We now knew how to handle ourselves in meetings, how to record minutes, how to respond to official correspondence from government. One of the first targets of this new militancy was the small southwestern Ontario town of Dresden. It had been a symbol of freedom from an earlier age. Now, in the 1950s, like many Ontario towns, it practiced its own resolute form of racism. Dresden was not the American South. There were dozens of prosperous black farmers. Children of all races went to school together and played together. But despite appearances and despite its history, Dresden was a place where color meant everything. What was unusual about Dresden was its absoluteness. There was not a single pool room that would allow black people to shoot pool. There was not a single restaurant where a black person could buy a meal. There was not a single barber where they could get their hair cut. So it was the absoluteness, it was a totality of the discriminatory attitudes up in Dresden that made it unusual. Dresden native Hugh Burnett had served in the Canadian Army, but like many black men, Burnett had come home to a community whose attitudes were unchanged by the war. He told me that coming back into Dresden, he was driven through Windsor by two Americans and they said, let me buy a coffee, and they took him to McKay's, and they got to McKay, and they refused him service. And McKay was clear on it. He said he would serve the other guys, they were white Americans, and he wasn't going to serve him. Humiliated and angered by rejection in his hometown, 
Burnett and friends began to organize. They formed the National Unity Association to fight discrimination. Well, we're considered as second-class citizens now, and I think maybe we deserve to be if we won't fight for our rights. Beginning in 1947, Hugh Burnett and his allies began to pressure the Dresden Town Council for an equality bylaw. The Town Council referred the issue directly to the voters. So in 1949, the city fathers of Dresden decided to hold a referendum. And in that referendum, the people of the town of Dresden voted that they agreed with discrimination and that the restaurant should not serve, serve the Negroes. With the referendum, boom, you know, this really became the only time in Canadian history that uh, racial discrimination has ever been directly put to a vote. And the vote went to continue the discriminatory practices. Discrimination was widespread, not only in Dresden, but across the province. The referendum convinced the black community to take the case up to the next level, the government of Ontario. It was necessary to present definitive evidence on the seriousness of the problem. Politicians wanted the proof. And of course, not all politicians were in favor, I suppose, of, 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 of moving in the direction in which we were moving. Some of them were resisting because the government officials were saying, well, we have no proof that there is discrimination on the basis of race. Show us some evidence. And so we had to go out and do testing. We'd send out teams of black and white together, wherever there was apartments for rent. We had public meetings, union meetings, and uh, letter writing. The campaign produced an alliance of organizations pressing for change. There were black organizations, organized labor, religious groups, civil rights advocates, and others shut out by discrimination. It wasn't just blacks that were suffering in a country such as Canada. Jews were having their own difficulties into the 1950s. By virtue of their religion, they were discriminated against. By virtue of their religion, um, individuals wanted to keep them out of certain neighborhoods. There was no formal alliance, and then I discovered the Sleeping Car Porters Union. I remember uh, approaching them and being invited to a meeting and uh, experiencing something I had never seen before, the singing of the, of the uh, anthem, the Sleeping Car Porters Anthem. Uh, which was a peon of praise to A. Philip Randolph. Asa Philip Randolph was the leader of the Porter's Union in the United States and one of the heroes of the civil rights movement in North America. Randolph is our leader, we'll not let him down. Randolph, Randolph is, is our leader, leader and we shall not be moved. It's like trees planted by the water, we shall not be moved. Now, a powerful coalition had emerged with enough momentum to take the case against discrimination before the most powerful man in Ontario. So when we finally got to Queen's Park, I recall vividly the Premier, Leslie Frost, saying this is the largest delegation of colored people that I have seen in one place in all my public life. That I shall never forget. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Leslie Ms. Campbell Frost. Prime Minister of Ontario. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you, first of all, for... The civil rights movement had found an unlikely ally in Leslie Frost. He was a small-town lawyer from the conservative heartland of Ontario. But Frost was also a student of the American Civil War and a great admirer of President Abraham Lincoln. Despite strong opposition within his own party, Frost decided to take a stand. And Premier Frost, you have to give him credit because he was ahead of his time to enact legislation that became very effective because his, his own cabinet and his own government were not supportive of the legislation. And, and coming out publicly and saying, as long as he was Premier of this province, that he was not going to have any of the people living in this province as second-class citizens, that everybody would have equal treatment. In the early 1950s, Ontario made discrimination in housing and employment illegal. 
conceptually, this was a revolution. It was a reversal because you were taking the right away from the proprietor, a law that, a right that had been there for generations, for centuries, upheld by the courts, upheld by legislation, a right to discriminate. And you were saying, you can't do that anymore. So there was a shift in the, in the concept of whose rights were going to be protected by the law and by the courts. That was the theory. But in practice, discrimination in housing, restaurants, bars, and hotels continued. The new laws had to be put to the test. And what better place than the old battleground of Dresden? At Hugh Burnett's urging, testers were sent to the same restaurant where he'd been refused service after World War II. You know, I got into this Dresden thing because I grew up in Brockville, which was a very conservative town, and people treated us like, like we were people from Mars. They, they called us names in the street. Bromley Armstrong and Ruth Lohr have never forgotten what happened there. 45 years, almost yes. half a century. Do you feel old? No, no, yeah. I, not, uh, not at all. It certainly changed. I mean, it's certainly not a restaurant anymore, but... Um, so the fountain was over on this on side, the, side, and yeah. the boots were on the right side of mm -hmm. the restaurant. Ruth and I got into the restaurant, and we sat in a boot, and we sat there, and nobody appeared. We were well-dressed, we were well-behaved, we were clean, we didn't scream and yell, we didn't do anything out of the ordinary. We, so there was no reason that we weren't served. I saw this man standing beside a, a beef block with a cleaver in his hand. But there was nothing on the block, and he had this meat cleaver in his hand. And I said, are you the manager? And he's chopping slowly on this block. Chop, chop. I said, are you the manager? I've just come all the way from Toronto, and I'd like to get some service. And he was getting angry by the minute. His, his whole thing was changing, and he was chopping faster and faster and faster and faster. So I say, I better go back to the booth because I didn't want to have any problems. A Toronto Telegram reporter recorded the whole thing, and the story made front page news. The case was prosecuted, and the McKay restaurant fined $50 plus costs. But on appeal, the conviction was overturned on a technicality. So it meant that other people had to follow up and do second testing of the same restaurants. Well, eventually, and there's a conviction, and again appealed, with legal fees and what have you, the proprietor of McKay's restaurant decided it was getting too costly for him to appeal this to the Supreme Court of Canada. So he decided he would open the restaurant to everybody. Hugh Burnett and his allies were vindicated. But the victory had left deep scars. When the National Film Board sent a film crew to Dresden, they found a community still suspicious and defensive. Would you say that, uh, that, that racial prejudice in Dresden is a recent thing or an old thing or what? Well, I think it's fairly recent. I don't think we were uh, conscious of it until just lately. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's too recent. It's been going on for over 100 years, or around 100 years. And it's been as bad as long as I can remember as it is now. Well, I think uh, possibly that the fear of intermarriage is a great deal to do with it. If two people, uh, colored and white, if they decide that they want to be married, that's their freedom and that's their liberty. Not that we would encourage it, in fact, I feel we would discourage it as far as possible, but it's up to them to make their own decision. The fight in Dresden took a heavy toll on Hugh Burnett personally. As punishment for his activism, people in town stopped hiring him as a carpenter, and his business went under. When I was seven, my parents split up, and whether that was a direct effect of this or whether that would have happened anyway, I don't know. At my father's funeral, uh, Professor Walker spoke, and he basically made that comparison that my father was Canada's Martin Luther King. As Burnett and the others had found in Dresden, discrimination ran deep, and racism was embedded in social attitudes. Minstrel shows were still popular in Canada, white performers in blackface, ridiculing black life.
This would give the impression that black people were singing, dancing clowns, incapable of serious thought. Now, why would I, as a white person, hire him to be uh, work in my office when he's going to get up and sing and dance? <laughs> you know? It was years before minstrel shows were finally discredited. But blacks had also been stereotyped in film and literature. Today, class, we're going to read the story of Little Black Sambo. Once upon a time, there was a little black boy, and his name was Little name Black was Sambo. Little black Sam. And one of the most offensive to the black community was a book taught in grade schools all over the country. A beautiful little red coat. And a air of beautiful little... I grew up with Little Black Sambo and hated it. And you now being, I can recall being called Little Black Sambo in, in, when I was a kid and uh, resented it very, very much. I mean, my dad was saying he was called Sambo on the train. Hey, Sambo, do this for me, you know. And um, everywhere, you know, it was an insult. By the time Daniel Braithwaite's son was five years old, Little Black Sambo had also been made into a film that was screened in schools. Oh, run along the plane, honey child. But watch out for that bad old tiger. That old tiger sure do like dark meat. And one of the children exposed to this film was Danny Braithwaite's son, Paul. So when he came home, he told me that people said, oh, there's Little Black Sambo over there, you know, pointing to him. And um, I says, well, and I think I'll see what's going to be done about that. And I phoned my representatives about the film, and it should be removed from the schools. Others in the black community joined the fight. It took two years, but in the end, the book and the film were struck from the school curriculum. They say it's a chip on your shoulder, but it's not a chip on your shoulder. It's what they think is a chip on your shoulder is you're speaking for your rights. I rock the boat, I don't care, because we're in the water anyway, so we might as well, you know swim the best way we can, and that's the way I look at it. Through challenge, resistance, and struggle, blacks had begun to change the conventions and attitudes that underpinned discrimination. But the longest and most difficult struggle was still to come. Racism had long been a cornerstone of Canadian immigration policy. After World War II, tens of thousands of immigrants from European countries had been given virtually open access to the country. But there were tight restrictions on all Asians and blacks. A white West Indian could get into Canada. A white person in China could get in, or in India, but a Chinese or an Indian couldn't get in. That's the difference, because you have fixed your photograph to your application and when they see it, then they, that's how they assess it. When the country itself, when, they, when the national law is saying, we don't want black people in here, we don't let them come in, then that says something pretty profound to the black people who are already in here. I mean, what, what does that say about me? If my kind are unwelcome, if my kind aren't allowed in, that means that uh, I'm not at home here, I'm not wanted here. As late as 1952, the Immigration Act allowed the minister to prohibit the admission of any group he believed might be unsuitable for Canada's climate. They say it was too cold, we couldn't assimilate, because the, the, the people from the tropics couldn't, couldn't come into a frigid zone and, and, and withstand the climate, climatic conditions. You couldn't do it. Armstrong's own family was a victim of the immigration law. His mother, Edith, was detained at the border when she came to visit her sons. The man Bromley Armstrong turned to for help was Donald Willard Moore. Since the end of World War II, he had made the fight to change Canada's immigration policy a personal crusade. Don Moore had come to Canada from Barbados as a young man. And for the next 30 years, he fought for Caribbean families hoping to make a home here. His struggle would eventually change the face of Canada. Don Moore was an articulate man and some, someone who was taken seriously. 
not just by a sector of the community, the black community in Toronto, but also by politicians. Finally, in the spring of 1954, Moore resolved to attack the disease, not just the symptoms. Donald Moore provided the kind of leadership which provided the, co the community with confidence in the project that he had suggested going to Ottawa. Moore's plan was to travel to the capital and confront the Minister of Immigration directly. On April 27, 1954, the Negro Citizenship Association boarded the train for Ottawa, backed by the Canadian Labour Congress, religious groups, and 20 other Canadian organizations. Nearly half a century later, Stanley Grizel and Bromley Armstrong, two surviving members of the original delegation, retrace that historic journey to Ottawa. Don Moore's presentation to the minister was powerful and persuasive. He quoted from the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights and appealed to the Canadian sense of justice. Our association was born out of the heartaches, the pain and suffering of the Negro himself. In our appearance before you today, we bring no sword, no gun, no explosive, our only weapon is that of reason, justice, and love. We know that you will give ear to our requests. Our cause is just, and the love of mankind surmounts all difficulties. Don Moore traveled to other Commonwealth countries, urging political leaders to use their influence. In 1962, Ottawa changed its immigration policy. Racial origin would no longer bar the door. The criteria for admission would emphasize education, training, and skills. In the twilight of his years, Moore recalled what had driven his crusade. When I remember the tears that had been shed by immigrants waiting to get the final word, waiting in fear of being detained and sent back. Why? Because this skin of mine and yours was a little darker. Look at the benefits which have flowed and are flowing from an enlightened, uh, an enlightened immigration policy as Donald Moore suggested. Look at the benefits that have, have, have come out of it. You know, we have uh, the opportunity to meet peoples of the world right here in our community. And it has taught us by our interaction with people from other parts of the world that we have more in common than we have in differences, I often say. My Hung Lee. Thank you very much. Oh, Jiang Thomas Chan. Zahra Amid Jarevdi, Raushan Ara Sharmin, Oleg Kenjin. In 1977, in recognition of his work in the fields of labor, human, and civil rights, the Canadian government appointed Stanley G. Grizel a citizenship court judge. Things have improved so much over the years. And it just didn't happen. It came about through the efforts of the few who stuck together and presented briefs to governments, had community meetings in the churches and the unions. And as a result, what we have today is very rewarding to those of us who've been in the struggle all these years. Very comforting to see the new picture. <laughs> 